Welcome to Washington Today on C-SPAN Radio for Tuesday, February 13, 2024. The Senate passes the $95 billion foreign aid bill for Ukraine, Israel, Palestinians, and Taiwan in the early morning hours after an all-night session. And President Joe Biden urges the House to bring it up quickly for a vote, saying it needs to move, and opposing it is playing into Putin's hands. But House Speaker Mike Johnson says he does not plan to do that because the bill does not have U.S. border security reforms. The Speaker writing, the Senate's foreign aid bill is silent on the most pressing issue facing our country. Labor Department's inflation report for January is out. The Consumer Price Index increased 0.3% for the month, or 3.1% versus a year ago. That's more than had been expected. On Wall Street, the Dow Jones Industrial Average falling over 500 points. We'll hear from the White House Press Secretary and economist Mark Zandi. The head of the UN Palestinian Relief Agency warns against Israel launching a large-scale military assault on the southern Gaza city of Rafah, where over a million Palestinians have sought refuge from the war with Hamas. In the U.S. House impeachment inquiry of President Biden, closed-door deposition from Tony Babalunsky, former business associate of Hunter Biden, who testified, according to his released opening statement, that Joe Biden was more than a participant in and beneficiary of his family's business. He was an enabler, despite being buffered by a complex scheme to maintain plausible deniability. Former U.S. House Clerk Cheryl Johnson gets an award for upholding Democratic values, including her role in counting the presidential electoral votes after the 2020 election and dealing with the very long speaker's race in 2023. And on this Mardi Gras, two U.S. senators from Louisiana and Alabama argue over which state gets to claim it was the first to celebrate the holiday. Story from the New York Times, the Senate passed a long-awaited foreign aid package for Ukraine and Israel early Tuesday morning, delivering a bipartisan endorsement of the legislation after months of negotiations, dire battlefield warnings, and political mudslinging. But the measure faced a buzzsaw of opposition in the House, where Republicans' resistance threatened to kill it. 22 Senate Republicans voted with almost all Democrats for the bill, five more than had helped it over a final procedural hurdle on Monday night, while the rest of the party argued against continuing to fund a foreign nation's battle to protect its sovereignty without first cracking down on an influx of migration into the United States across its border with Mexico. That was from the New York Times. The final vote in the Senate wrapped up about 6.30 a.m. Eastern after an all-night session. And a few hours later, the Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer held a news conference. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us after a long night. Today, after not just a long night and weekend, but after months of work, we can say it's been worth it. Today we witnessed one of the most historic and consequential bills passed the Senate, a bill that so greatly impacts not just our national security, not just the security of our allies, but also the security of Western democracy as we know it. Tonight, finally, America led the way for freedom and democracy. And with this bill, the Senate declares that American leadership will not waver, falter, or fail. Today, the Senate keeps its word to Ukrainians in need, desperate need, of supplies and ammunition, to innocent Palestinian civilians in need, so much need, of relief, to Israelis in need of support, and to U.S. service members on patrol in the Indo-Pacific, the Red Sea, and around the world. Today, we sent a clear bipartisan message to resol to, of resolve to our allies in NATO. With the strong bipartisan vote in the Senate, it's clear that if Speaker Johnson brings this bill to the House floor, it will pass with that same bipartisan support. The responsibility now falls on Speaker Johnson and House Republicans to approve this bill swiftly. And I call on Speaker Johnson to rise to the occasion, to do the right thing, bring this bill to the floor. As I said, given the large, robust majority here in the Senate, 
it is clear that if that bill is brought to the floor, our bill is brought to the floor, it will pass. But if the hard right kills this bill, it would be an enormous gift to Vladimir Putin. It would be a betrayal of our partners and allies and an abandonment of our service members. The Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, Democrat from New York, at a news conference this morning. The $95 billion bill includes about $60 billion for Ukraine, $14 billion for Israel, $10 billion for humanitarian aid, including for Palestinians in Gaza. The vote in the Senate, as he mentioned, 70 to 29. It included 22 Republicans voting yes. Three senators in the Democratic caucus voted no. Bernie Sanders, Peter Welch, and Jeff Merkley. Sanders and Welch from Vermont, Jeff Merkley from Oregon. Speaker Mike Johnson, Republican of Louisiana, putting out a written statement Monday night that reads, House Republicans were crystal clear from the very beginning of discussions that any so-called national security supplemental legislation must recognize that national security begins at our own border. The House acted 10 months ago to help enact transformative policy change by passing the Secure Our Border Act. And since then, including today, the Senate has failed to meet the moment. Today, the House Majority Whip, Tom Emmer, Republican of Minnesota, was interviewed on CNBC. He has effectively said we can't move this without securing our southern border. So uh, we'll see the uh, Congress, the House is coming back into session tonight. And I'm sure once all our members are back, then it'll be a much clearer picture. I just, that sounds like a catch-22, though, uh, doesn't it? Because we can't secure the border because the former President Trump uh, wants people to, to be loyal to his, uh, his notion that don't do anything that, that, that could help uh, President Biden. So it, it's almost like we, we won't vote on anything until we secure the border, but we won't vote on something to secure the border. Well, I, I would say that's not accurate. I mean, there was an effort over on the Senate. Uh, the, our speaker had made it very clear that our members would require for in return for uh, foreign aid, uh, specifically Ukraine. Not only did we have to have certain questions answered uh, when it comes to the Ukraine aid, but uh, when you bring it over, you got to make sure that it has border security on it. There was a two month negotiation, Joe, that literally turned out a product that could not be done uh, in the House or the Senate. Uh, if you'll remember back last May, the House passed a border security bill that had five pieces. Finish the wall, reform parole authority, reform the asylum authority, end catch and release, and restore remain in Mexico, which by the way, our border patrol has said by just doing the last one, restoring remain in Mexico, it would staunch the flow across our southern border by some 70% overnight. What did the Senate send us? They sent us something that does nothing with the, board, with the uh, wall, does nothing with parole, does nothing with asylum, does not restore remain in Mexico, and quite frankly codified what they're already doing illegally when it comes to catch and release by saying you get shutdown authority at 5,000 a day coming across our southern border. Uh, insanity. They need to get that done. And, and by the way, there's another way to handle it. If the president would just undo the 64 executive orders that he has signed since he took office, which effectively opened our southern border, uh, you could solve it that way, too. But we're going to have to figure out how to get this done in order to move this stuff here in the House. Congressman Tom Emmer, Republican of Minnesota, the majority whip, interviewed on CNBC. Story from The Hill, the Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, Republican of Kentucky, encouraged House Speaker Mike Johnson to move forward with a vote on Ukraine aid and other foreign policy spending on Tuesday after the Senate passed the measure in a pre-dawn vote. He told reporters at the Capitol, we've heard all kinds of rumors about whether the House supports Ukraine or doesn't. It seems to me that the easy way to solve that would be to vote. And I hope the Speaker will find a way to allow the House to work its will on the issue of Ukraine aid and the other parts of the bill as well. And Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky posting the decision by the U.S. Senate to continue the support for our country and our warriors has been anticipated not only by us, but also by many other nations, particularly those in Europe. The world is looking for American leadership to remain steadfast, help protect lives and preserve freedom. This truly contributes to confidence and motivation. 
other U.S. House members today are beginning to weigh in on this legislation. Again, it's $95 billion for Ukraine and Israel and Taiwan and aid to the Palestinians, not including U.S. border security in this bill. Here is Congressman Stephen Lynch, Democrat from Massachusetts, on the House floor. As a member of the House Subcommittee on National Security, I rise in strong support of emergency aid for our Democratic ally and partner and for the people of Ukraine. Now entering the third year of their fight for freedom and democracy in the face of the brutal invasion launched by Russian President Vladimir Putin in 2022. This morning, the United States Senate passed a bipartisan foreign aid package that included vital Ukraine assistance by a wide vote of 70 to 29. In stark contrast to this bipartisan effort, the House Republican leadership continues to fall in line behind former President Trump, refusing to act swiftly on Ukraine funding on purely partisan political grounds. Regrettably, Speaker Johnson has already dismissed the Senate bill as a status quo measure. Madam Speaker, this is a missed opportunity. Members of this House should have the right to vote on a package of Ukraine funding Israel funding and greater security funding for our southern border. On the issue of Ukraine funding in particular, this political impasse comes at the great expense of U.S. national security, international peace, and the freedom of the Ukrainian people. It also follows repeated warnings from the Biden administration that the failure to enact additional aid will kneecap Ukraine on the battlefield. It will allow Putin, an an autocratic dictator, to prevail and simply paved the way for a Russian military victory. Even the Republican chairman of the House Intelligence Committee recently reported that with the Ukrainian armed forces now desperately rationing munitions, he quotes, we'll have to get this done. If we do not move, we will be abandoning Ukraine. Congressman Stephen Lynch, Democrat from Massachusetts, on the House floor. The Democratic leader in the House, Akeem Jeffries, sending a Dear Colleague letter that reads in part, the American people deserve an up and or down vote, and we will use every available legislative tool to get comprehensive national security legislation over the finish line. The United States Senate has done its job. It is time for the House representatives to do the same. One legislative tool that might be available is a discharge petition, which can force a floor vote on a bill if the petition gets signatures of a majority of the House, but that would take at least some Republican support as the Republicans are in the majority. Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene, Republican of Georgia, also speaking today about the foreign aid bill that passed the Senate, opposing the aid to Ukraine and saying there needs to be U.S. border security changes added. I'd like to urge the House and the Senate together to consider what terrible days we're in for the American taxpayer. America has been enslaved in $34 trillion in debt. And yet over the weekend, the Senate went into overtime throughout the Super Bowl and beyond into the early morning hours to pass a $95 billion package to fund foreign wars. $95 billion. And not a penny of that goes to anything for any American. Our border is completely being invaded every single day by millions and millions of people from all over the world, over 160 countries. Over 2 million gotaways are in America today. A gotaway is a person from a country we do not know where they're from. We do not know where they are inside our country, what state they are in, what city they are in. We do not know what they're going to do here on our homeland but we've lost them. Over 10 million people have crossed the border during the Biden administration, yet the Senate works overtime to fund foreign wars. 95 billion and 60 billion of that is to go to Ukraine. America has already sent $113 billion to the failing war in Ukraine. It's a complete buzzsaw for an entire generation of Ukrainian men. This is a land where there should be peace talks continuously ending this war, not a place where we continue to write blank checks and say, keep keep the money laundering going, keep the corruption going, keep selling our weapons to lands and countries and governments we do not know. Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene, Republican from Georgia, on the House floor. 
CBS News reports the House on Tuesday is expected to vote for a second time in a week to impeach the Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. After Republican leaders suffered an embarrassing defeat in their first effort, Mayorkas narrowly survived last week's vote. After a small group of Republicans who said President Biden's border chief did not commit impeachable offenses for his handling of the U.S.-Mexico border crisis, voted with all Democrats to sink it. Republicans vowed they would try again once the House Majority Leader Steve Scalise, who had been undergoing cancer treatment, returned to Washington. The Louisiana Republican will be back at work this week, giving them another vote that is expected to tip the scale in their favor, barring any absences. That was from CBS News. More on the $95 billion bill, aid to Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan, that passed the Senate. President Joe Biden called today on the House to take it up quickly. Earlier this morning, the United States Senate, as you all know, voted overwhelmingly by a margin of 70 to 29 to move forward with the bipartisan national security bill. Now, now it moves to the House. And I urge Speaker Johnson to bring it to the floor immediately, immediately. There's no question that a Senate bill was put on the floor in the House of Representatives. It would pass. It would pass. And the Speaker knows that. So I call on the Speaker to let the full House speak its mind and not allow a minority of most extreme voices in the House to block this bill even from being voted on. Even from being voted on. This is a critical act for the House to move. It needs to move. The bill provides urgent funding for Ukraine so it can keep defending itself against Putin's vicious, vicious onslaught. We've all seen the terrible stories in recent weeks. Ukrainian soldiers out of artillery shells, Ukrainian units, rationing rounds of ammunition to defend themselves. Ukrainian families worried that the next Russian strike will permanently plunge them into darkness or worse. This bipartisan bill sends a clear message to Ukrainians and to our partners and to our allies around the world. America can be trusted. America can be relied upon. And America stands up for freedom. We stand strong for our allies. We never bow down to anyone, and certainly not to Vladimir Putin. So let's get on with this. President Biden at the White House. During his remarks, he also talked about former President Donald Trump's recent comments on Russia and NATO. The stakes are already high for American security before this bill was passed in the Senate last night. But in recent days, those stakes have risen. And that's because the former president has sent a dangerous and shockingly, frankly, un-American signal to the world. Just a few days ago, Trump gave an invitation to Putin to invade some of our allies, NATO allies. He said if an ally didn't spend enough money on defense, he would encourage Russia to, quote, do whatever the hell they want, end of quote. Can you imagine a former president of the United States saying that? The whole world heard it. The worst thing is he means it. No other president in our history has ever bowed down to a Russian dictator. Well, let me say this as clearly as I can. I never will. For God's sake, it's dumb, it's shameful, it's dangerous, it's un-American. When America gives us word, it means something. When we make a commitment, we keep it. And NATO is a sacred commitment. Donald Trump looks at this as if it's a burden. When he looks at NATO, he doesn't see the alliance that protects America and the world. He sees a protection racket. He doesn't understand that NATO is built on fundamental principles of freedom, security, and national sovereignty. Because for Trump, principles never matter. Everything is transactional. He doesn't understand that the sacred commitment we've given works for us as well. In fact, I would remind Trump And all those who would walk away from NATO, Article 5 has only been invoked once, just once in our NATO history. And it was done to stand with America after we were attacked on 9-11. We should never forget it. You know, our adversaries have long sought to create cracks in the alliance. The greatest hope of all those who wish America harm is for NATO to fall apart. And you can be sure that they all cheered when they heard Donald Trump and heard what he said. I know this. I will not walk away. I can't imagine any other president walking away. 
For as long as I'm president, if Putin attacks a NATO ally, the United States will defend every inch of NATO territory. President Biden at the White House. This is Washington Today. From the Wall Street Journal, inflation cooled again in January, but came in above Wall Street's expectations. Another sign that the Federal Reserve's path to interest rate cuts is far from settled. The Labor Department reported Tuesday that consumer prices rose 3.1 percent in January from a year earlier versus a December gain of 3.4 percent. That marked the lowest reading since June. Still, the consumer price index was higher than the predicted 2.9 percent, a disappointment for investors who hope the Fed will cut rates sooner rather than later. That from the Wall Street Journal. A question about the inflation report today to the White House Press Secretary, Corinne Jean-Pierre. Inflation, um, I know you were asked about it earlier, but there are elements of the report, food, shelter, services, that all kind of accelerated, certainly above estimates. And I'm wondering, um, you said the economy was in a much different place. Is there any worry that inflation might actually be picking back up and that we could see a sort of a... So we have concerns, basically. Uh, um, look, um, and you, you've heard um, Jared say this from this podium, uh, and many others who are part of our economic team is that we we certainly we look at trends. That is something that we do here, and not read too much to to you know to uh, data from one month. That is how we operate here, uh, and others do as well. Uh, but we certainly understand that there's more work to be done to lower costs. That is something that we're aware of, uh, and so. Certainly not going to get into forecasting from here. Uh, we're going to try and continue to make co- progress in lowering uh, infl- in lowering uh, uh, inflation uh, as we transition to a steady and stable uh, stable economic growth, which you hear us speak to that uh, very often. And so, what I will say is, uh, inflation is down two thirds from its peak. Core inflation is the lowest since May 21st. Prices fell over the last year, as I mentioned before: gas, milk, and eggs, uh, all important products that matter to uh, uh, to the American people. And we know that rental inflation has slowed, but it takes a while to show up in CPI. And so, look, that's what we say. We look at the trend. We see how how the economy is moving uh, and we don't focus on a one month, uh, one month data. And so I think that's what's important here. But we're also going to do continue to do the work to lower costs. The White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre during her news conference in the White House briefing room. Congresswoman Young Kim, Republican of California, posting on X. The latest CPI numbers confirm that inflation is not transitory as families continue to pay more for less. I'm committed to reigning in reckless spending, contributing to inflation and promoting common sense policies to make life more affordable. Mark Zandi, the chief economist of Moody's Analytics, also posting on X. The January report on consumer prices was disappointing, but doesn't change the trend of decelerating inflation nor prospects for inflation to return to the Fed's target by the second half of the year. Indeed, inflation is already below the Fed's target, save for the cost of shelter. Mark Zandi spoke more about this at the National Economic Club meeting in Washington, D.C. Reason number one for optimism, I already alluded to it, Uh, inflation, it is coming in uh, uh, reasonably gracefully. uh, uh, if you look at consumer price inflation, of course we got the CPI report for January today, but if you look at uh, uh, CPI inflation excluding shelter, and I know shelter is a big component of CPI, a little over a third of the index, and I'll talk about that in just a second, but just take that out. Uh, CPI inflation is already back to the Federal Reserve's target and then some. In fact, I, I did this very quickly. I, I, I was down in Florida. I took a plane up here. I've got a few things going on here over the next couple of days. Got to the hotel. They gave me the room, so I had a few minutes to look at the data. And if I have the data right, the year-over-year growth in CPI X shelter in January was 1.6 percent. One point. Obviously, the target is on CPI inflation is over two. It's got to be something closer to two and a half. So the, the real uh, gap between uh, where we are on inflation, CPI inflation, uh, overall inflation, where we want to be is the cost of uh, shelter. Uh, and that, that's where we had the surprise today. I, I don't know if you noticed, but that's where the, the, the miss was in terms of uh, the number. It came in hot, uh, particularly on owners, so-called owner's equivalent rent, which is the cost of uh, home ownership. And uh, all the data would suggest that that should moderate. I mean, I forecast many things. Um, 
Some things I'm very confident in, not so much. I'm very confident that the growth in the cost of housing services is going to come in here because ultimately that's tied to market rents. And rents, if you look at all the plethora of data there, are, are down, are flat to down over the past year and uh, are going to be flat to down in the coming year uh, because we have a lot of multifamily supply coming into the market. A lot of multifamily property got bottled up in, this, in the, because of supply chain issues, labor market issues during the pandemic. Uh, and uh, uh, builders couldn't get the, the uh, building across the, the finish line. But now that the pandemic is in the rearview mirror, supply chains have normalized, labor markets are back up and running, all that supply is coming in, vacancy rates are starting to rise. You can see it in these big towers going up in urban centers like D.C. or my hometown of Philly or Chicago or San Francisco. And uh, that's going to put downward pressure on rent. And that's going to flow through. And we're going to see uh, housing costs come in and inflation back to target. So I'd be surprised if we're not back to the Federal Reserve's target by the second half of, uh, by the second half of this year. I, I think all the trend lines look good, d despite uh, today's numbers and the market reaction to that. We'll see how it ends up uh, in the market today. But I, you know, I think uh, we're, we're in pretty good shape there. Mark Zandi, Moody's Analytics Chief Economist at a meeting of the National Economic Club held at Logan Tavern in Washington, D.C. And on Wall Street today, the Dow down 524, NASDAQ down 286, S&P down 68. The American Federation of Government Employees held a rally on Capitol Hill for what the union says is a call for fair pay for federal D.C. government employees. They're also calling on Congress to pass the FAIR Act and fully fund the government for fiscal year 2024. The FAIR Act, introduced by Democratic lawmakers, stands for Federal Adjustment of Income Rates Act and would give federal employees a 7.4 percent pay raise in 2025. And current federal funding runs out March 1st for some parts of the government and March 8th for the rest. One of the speakers today at the rally, Congressman Greg Kassar, Democrat of Texas. On the hill, at that door, what do we tell them? On the hill, at that door, what do we tell them? What do we want? What do we want? And when they say they don't have the money for it, nobody can smell out BS like a union member. We know the money is there. We know the money is there. Just the other day, we saw them send hundreds of billions of dollars in tax breaks to their corporate donors. Just the other day, my very first bill as a member of Congress that they said they wanted us to work on, these guys that say they care about inflation, these guys that say they care about working people, the first bill they asked me to vote on as a member of Congress was to cut the IRS agents that go after corporate tax cheats. Boo! They always find the money for when it's for their billionaire buddies. They always find the money when it's to wage war, to hurt people. But we know the money is there to pay the everyday person that is doing the work of protecting this country. That meat doesn't get inspected on its own. Those workplaces don't get kept safe on their own. People don't get their Social Security check on their own. That health care is something that people fought for and built in this U.S. Congress, but you deliver it, and it's time for the U.S. Congress to do our job. Do your job. Do your job. Do your job. Do your job. I think it's ridiculous. I came here from Texas wanting to make sure that we took care of working people, make sure we got rid of right to work for less laws, make sure people can bargain a fair contract, have a more fair economy. And instead, what we're showing up and saying is, don't shut down the entire U.S. government. That's what we're fighting over, really? And the reason for it is because they are the arsonists and they try to blame the firefighters for the flames. Are we going to let them blame us for the flames? No, we're going to hold the arsonists accountable. Congressman Greg Kassar, Democrat from Texas, one of several Democratic members of the House speaking at today's rally on Capitol Hill in Washington, hosted by the American Federation of Government Employees, the union that says it has 750,000 members. Washington Today continues in a moment. Hi, this is Rachel from C-SPAN's podcast team. I'd like to introduce you to one of the producers here at C-SPAN, my colleague, Sean. 
Thanks, Rachel. If you're a fan of Washington Today, we think you'll also like our evening newsletter, Word for Word, which brings you a recap of the day's most important political and policy events delivered right to your inbox. Read about what happened on Capitol Hill and at the White House and watch video highlights featuring the day's newsmakers. Hear them word for word. Join our community of informed listeners and viewers. Head over to cspan.org slash connect and subscribe to Word for Word today. Thanks for listening and staying connected with Word for Word. Subscribe now at cspan.org slash connect. Thank you. Welcome back to Washington Today, available as a podcast wherever you find your podcast and on the C-SPAN Now mobile app, which is free. Story from the Washington Post, Israel and Hamas are making progress toward another ceasefire and hostage release deal, officials said Tuesday as negotiations went on. And Israel threatened to expand its offensive to Gaza's southern edge, where some 1.4 million Palestinians have sought refuge. The talks continued in Egypt a day after Israeli forces rescued two captives in Rafah, the Pax southern town along the Egyptian border, in a raid that killed at least 74 Palestinians, according to local health officials, and caused heavy destruction. The operation offered a glimpse of what a full-blown ground offensive might look like. That was the reporting from the Washington Post. The Commissioner General of UNRWA, the UN Palestinian Relief Agency, Philippe Lazzarini, told reporters today at the UN in New York City that an assault on Rafah would be a disaster for the Palestinians there. I just had a two hours briefing with the member states. Um, basically, uh, we were talking about the situation in uh, Rafah, which is uh, deeply, deeply concerning. And uh, as you know, people are anxious and in fear of a possible large-scale military operation. Um, If this military operation is taking place, the question is, where will the civilian go? There is absolutely no safe place in Rafah anymore. And the fear is that uh, the number of people killed and injured might again significantly increase in a conflict where I reminded uh, that already more than 100,000 people have been either killed, either injured, or are missing, which means in four months' time, 5% of the population, and we are still talking about uh, the largest military offensive in the middle of a sea of displaced people. They are asked to move. The question is where to move. If you are in Rafa, you would see that from the border to Betlaya, which is 20 kilometer stretch, you only see plastic makeshift where hundreds of thousands of people are already living. Philippe Lazzarini, the Commissioner General of UNRWA, with reporters at the UN in New York City, he also went on to say that investigations are underway into the allegations that his agency's personnel were involved in the Hamas terror attack on Israel on October 7th and that a Hamas tunnel has been found under a UNRWA building in Gaza. At the White House, the National Security Communications Advisor John Kirby taking questions about Israel's plans for Rafa. The president said that there should be a credible and executable plan in place uh, to safeguard civilians in Rafah before Israel were to launch any kind of ground invasion. What is, in the White House view, what would a credible plan look like? How would you ever realistically move 1.4 million people out of the way? I think what uh, what. First of all, you know they'd have to they'd be the ones that have to come up with this plan. I think what we'd want to see in, in any kind of a plan to make it credible would be to account for, as I think MJ was asking me yesterday, to account for the now more than mil- a million people, some estimates up to a million and a half that are seeking refuge in Rafa. It's a small geographical space, the Gaza Strip. Period. It's really small down there around Rafa, and you got a million to a million and a half people that um, are seeking safety, and so. Any credible plan that could be executable would have to take into account their physical movement, safe movement, as well as um, uh, proper uh, substance for them, you know, food, water, medicine, access to to health care and uh, and uh, and, you know, be able to to stay uh, together as family units. So all of that would have to be uh, factored in. 
does the White House believe there is any possible plan out there that would be executable, given the infrastructure situation within Gaza right now? Again, we haven't seen what the Israelis are thinking or what, uh, what exactly they're putting pen to paper on. Prime Minister Netanyahu said that he had tasked his army, the IDF, to do exactly that. So we'll see what they come up with. The White House National Security Communications Advisor, John Kirby, with reporters in the White House briefing room. Story from CNN, the South African government has made an urgent request to the International Court of Justice to decide if Israel's military actions in Rafah require the court to use its power to prevent further imminent breach of the rights of Palestinians in Gaza. In a statement issued by the country's presidency on Tuesday, the South African government called the southern Gaza city of Rafah the last refuge for surviving people in Gaza. That was from CNN. An update today from the Pentagon on the health of Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin, who has been in the hospital for a couple of days. The Pentagon Deputy Press Secretary Sabrina Singh spoke mid-afternoon. Secretary Austin is still at Walter Reed National Military Medical Center and is in good condition. Deputy Secretary Hicks continues to retain the functions and duties of the Secretary of Defense at this time. However, we anticipate Secretary Austin will be released from the hospital later today, so we will provide an update on when that occurs and when he resumes his full duties and functions. Also, as briefed yesterday, the Secretary still intends to participate in the virtual Ukraine Defense Contact Group tomorrow. This includes delivering opening remarks, which will be live streamed and available to view on the DoD website. Again, we will continue to keep you updated on Secretary Austin's status later today. The Pentagon Deputy Press Secretary Sabrina Singh speaking to reporters mid-afternoon. This is Washington Today. From Fox News, Joe Biden enabled his son Hunter to sell access to the United States' most dangerous adversaries, including the Chinese Communist Party, Russia, and more. The first son's ex-business associate, Tony Babalinsky, is expected to testify as part of the impeachment inquiry Tuesday. Babalinsky, who worked with Hunter Biden to create the joint venture Sinohawk Holdings with Chinese energy company CEFC, and said he met with Joe Biden in 2017, is testifying behind closed doors at the House Oversight and Judiciary Committee's Tuesday. Fox News Digital obtained a copy of Babalinsky's prepared opening statement. He will testify that from his direct personal experience, it is clear that Joe Biden was the brand being sold by the Biden family. And another quote, his family's foreign influence peddling operation from China to Ukraine and elsewhere sold out to foreign actors who were seeking to gain influence and access to Joe Biden and the United States government. That was reporting from Fox News. This was closed door testimony, but outside there was a microphone stand and Members of Congress could come out and speak to reporters, and Congressman Jim Jordan, Republican of Ohio, chair of the Judiciary Committee, did. Tony Bobulinski thought he was wronged by the Bidens in his his business operations, um, and he felt that Joe Biden uh, wasn't being squared with the American people, so he came forward. Uh, I would just point out that Tony Bobulinski, unlike the White House, Tony Bobulinski's uh, story has not changed. Uh, the White House, on the other hand, you know, what, what Joe Biden said, I've never spoken to my son about his business, and that quickly changed to, well, um, I never was in business with my son. And then, of course, when Hunter Biden did his press conference back on December 13th, when he didn't come in for his deposition, uh, he said, my father was not financially involved in the business. So their story has changed. But Hunter Biden, or excuse me, but Tony Bobulinski has has not uh, not changed his, his story and in, in, in what he's conveyed to um, to the country and to the committee, and I think that's uh, that's important. I mean, Rob Walker was in a couple of weeks ago. He wouldn't even confirm. <laughs> he, he wouldn't even say the big guys have reference to Joe Biden for goodness sake. Uh, so um, again, we got I think we got another hour or so to go. But I got to run back over to the uh, to the Capitol. But I think it's been some good testimony that will fit in with the other testimony we've received, and that we will get. Uh, you know, we got a few other witnesses coming, specifically Jim Biden next week and Hunter Biden in two weeks. And speaking of more witnesses coming in, we're hearing that Special Counsel Herr could possibly come in in the coming weeks. Do you have any timeline on that? We're definitely working on that. We expect him to be in front of the committee as soon as possible, but we don't have a date to announce yet, uh, but we're working on that. What do you comes out of that testimony? Well, we're going to ask him all kinds of questions. I mean, there's just, you can go right with the report, things he said in the report about he intentionally deliberately. I mean, I think I counted up as I was reading through the report this past weekend, that there were classified documents at his at his at his at the Penn Biden Center at the University of Delaware at his home in multiple locations at his other home. 
I mean, when you counted up all the locations, including all the different places in the, in the, in the library, the den, the bedroom, the, the, the garage, the, the storage area in the garage, I think it was like nine different places he kept classified documents over several years, willfully, intentionally, deliberately did that according to the special counsel's report. And then there's, of course, the, the other information that the counsel gave us on his reflections of how Mr. Biden would appear, President Biden, I should say, would appear in front of a jury. So I think we'll probe all that, but we're trying to pin down the date. Thank you all very much. Today that would move the needle towards impeachment. Congressman Jim Jordan, Republican of Ohio, chair of J- Judiciary Committee, speaking to reporters outside the deposition room where the House Judiciary and House Oversight Committees were taking testimony from a former business associate of Hunter Biden, Tony Babalunsky. Two other members of the committee came out to speak to reporters, both Democrats, Dan Goldman of New York and Robert Garcia of California. We understand that Mr. Babalinsky's um, campaign speech uh, formed as an opening statement was released. Um, we would just Uh, reiterate that notwithstanding all of the flowery allegations uh, on questioning from the Republicans, he said that he had two conversations with President Biden uh, ever, and neither one of them had anything to do or in any relation or any discussion of any of these business dealings. So once again, we have yet another witness who Chairman Comer says is their star witness, who has, even in his own slanted testimony, has completely separated President Biden from any of the business dealings related to Hunter. Yeah, I want to just add to that. I think first, we've just sat through an hour uh, of, the, of testimony, and there has been zero evidence not one shred of evidence linking President Biden to any sort of business dealings that Hunter or, or Mr. Belinsky may have had um, uh, with, with each other. I, I also think it's really important that we remember uh, that this is somebody that was a guest to the presidential debate uh, on behalf of Donald Trump. This is somebody that has an ax to grind as a Republican. This is somebody that is clearly incredibly political. But the most important thing that we've learned in this last hour, which quite frankly was really uh, much a a waste of time, is that there is no evidence linking the president. He has zero. He had two brief interactions at which he himself admitted no business was actually ever discussed. So I think that's really, really critical and important here. I think it's also really important that he is choosing to make this very partisan. Uh, he clearly has um, his own financial issues that he's dealing with himself. Um, but I think the, 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 the bottom line here is that President Biden, there's no evidence, there's no link, and he's completely clear here. So we feel very confident. Democratic members of Congress, Robert Garcia of California, and before that, Dan Goldman of New York, with reporters outside the hearing room where the deposition was taking place. The U.S. Capitol Historical Society today presented its 2023 Freedom Award to former U.S. House Clerk Cheryl Johnson for, the society writes, her exceptional leadership and pivotal role in preserving and and commitment to upholding the American democratic process. Specifically, she played a significant part in organizing the certification of the 2020 presidential election and maintaining order while presiding over the U.S. House representatives during the week-long speaker vote series in January 2023. Cheryl Johnson was House clerk from February 2019 through June 2023. Today's ceremony held in the U.S. Capitol Building Statuary Hall and one of the Speakers at the ceremony, former U.S. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy, Republican of California. During the Speaker's elections, members could not be sworn in. There were no rules in place, but there was decorum. Why? Because the House had Cheryl. There was no roadmap, but there was order. Why? Because the House had Cheryl. There was no ready-made strip but there was a steady leadership. Why? Because the House had Cheryl. Every member of the House praised her for how she stepped up to the plate, or should I say podium. No matter the divisions, no matter the disagreements, Cheryl maintained decorum, dignity, and the honor of the House. When it was all over, Cheryl deserved a long vacation. 
but I knew the house still needed her, which is why I asked her to stay on as clerk. Fortunately, she agreed, serving through June 2023. That makes her the first clerk to serve under speakers from both parties. Her commitment to the traditions of the people of the House is remarkable. Former House Speaker Kevin McCarthy in Statuary Hall in the U.S. Capitol Building as the U.S. Capitol Historical Society presents its annual Freedom Award to the former House Clerk, Cheryl Johnson. Today is Mardi Gras. Senator Tommy Tuberville, Republican of Alabama, posted a video of him and Senator John Kennedy, Republican of Louisiana, in his office, decorated with bunting in the Mardi Gras colors, purple, green, and gold, for a king cake tasting and some debate over which state can claim to be the origins of the holiday. He knows our king cake is better, and he asked to do this so he can taste our king cake. King cake challenge. King cake challenge. But we did now. In 1703, start the first Mardi Gras break. We passed it on down to you folks in Louisiana. You do not have to be a senior at LSU to understand that, number one, Mardi Gras was invented in New Orleans. You know how I know that? I read it on Twitter. But I've tasted one, that one. They're both pretty good. It's hard to beat sugar. That's a sugar good for me. There's not a lot of difference here, but... What do you think, Tom? I'd give both of them a plus on sugar. I'd give this one here on the right a plus on texture nut. And this one on the left, the taste is unbelievable. There's not a lot of difference, you know, when, there, you, when, you, cover, difference. when you cover something with sugar. Uh, I like them both. I do too. I, do too. I think it's a tie. I think the only time you and I agree on anything since we've been up. That's not true. That's <laughs> not <laughs> true. All right, it's a tie. It's good king cake. Let's call it a tie. Call it a draw. Happy Mardi Gras to everybody in Alabama and everybody in Louisiana. Senator John Kennedy, Republican of Louisiana, and Senator Tommy Tuberville, Republican of Alabama. Senator Tuberville's office posting that video and adding the music. And thanks for listening to Washington Today. Sign up for C-SPAN's evening newsletter, Word for Word, and get the stories making headlines in Washington sent to your inbox every day. Subscribe at cspan.org slash connect. Have a good night. Mm-hmm.